Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, buenos, buenos, good morning. Good morning, buenos dias. Buenos dias. Thank you so much. Buenos dias. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jason Marzak. I'm the uh, director of the Latin America Economic Growth Initiative here at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's important discussion, which is part of our series on U.S.-Mexico relations at this critical moment. It's also the launch of our Latin America strategy paper. Uh, we have many distinguished uh, guests in the room today. Thank you, all the ambassadors who are here today, Ambassador Ponte and others. Uh, and a very special welcome to Adrian Arst as well. Uh, Adrian is the, the founder and inspiration behind the Adrian Arst Latin America Center. The, uh, the vision of Adrian is why we're all in this room right now together today. So we can, we can thank you, Adrian, for, for your, your leadership. Uh, and also welcome to all of us joining via, via webcast and following along on Twitter. Uh, you can feel free to get out your phones during this conversation, uh, but only to tweet uh, about this conversation. And if you're doing so, please use the hashtags ACLADAM or AC Scowcroft and using, or sorry, those are the handles, the handles AC Latin, AC Scowcroft, so, so try to get this, and the hashtag AC Strategy. What an honor today to be joined by Margarita Zavala, uh, the leading contender for the presidency of Mexico in next year's election, and also Michael Chertoff, the former uh, U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security and founder of the Chertoff Group, as well as Ambassador uh, Thomas Pickering. The incredible crowd here, the standing room crowd, I think is testament to not only the importance of the issue, but to the three of you and, and, and your, your leadership and, your, and, and, the, and the incredible uh, 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 vision that you have and the, and the words that people are, are looking forward to hearing. Uh, Ambassador Pickering, Pickering will give opening remarks and then my colleague and uh, partner in crime, Peter Schechter, will then captain a conversation today with Ms. Zavala and Secretary Chertoff. But first, before we go any further, I'd like to first take a moment and frame what's happening with Mexico today in a, in a larger regional context. It's a tall order, but Peter and I, with the contribution of Rachel DeLevy Ori, uh, have sought to do just that with a publication that we're also launching today, which is aptly named Beyond the Headlines, a, US, a strategy for US engagement with Latin America and the Trump era. Now this is part of the Atlantic Council strategy paper series, which has released regional and thematic papers, uh, upwards of 10 regional and thematic papers that offer guidance around some of the gr uh, greatest foreign policy challenges of our time. Uh, not only uh, Latin America, of course, uh, but everything from Iran to Africa to cyberspace. And I'd like to thank Dr. Alexander Murchev, uh, Fred Kemp, and Barry Pavel, who are the leaders and executive editors of the Atlantic Council strategy paper series for their vision on this project. Now, we have copies of our paper uh, outside this morning, hot off the press, and although I don't want to spoil it for all of you who are planning going back to your offices, canceling your meetings, and reading the paper immediately after this event, I do want to just give a quick overview uh, for those that might not have the time to do so today. Um, this is all of our paper is all about how do we maximize the opportunities and minimize the challenges for the U.S. as we look to Latin America. And I think in doing that, we first need to take a step back. U.S. relations with Latin America have historically been quite turbulent. But we need, we, we need our Latin American partners, but we have, throughout much of our history, really taken Latin America for granted. And only recently have relations reached a new point of partnership. But what we have witnessed in recent weeks is that President Trump will frankly approach the relationship with Latin America with the same convic conviction to disrupt as he does with many other policies. And the region is taking notice with its own reaction. We have to be prepared for that reaction from the region. Still, as this administration moves forward on critical issues of foreign policy, we believe that a U.S. approach to Latin America exists that creates a mutually beneficial win-win outcome for both countries and the region and in the context of the administration's approach toward foreign policy. Underline that as a belief that Latin America is today a formidable global player and a key strategic partner to the United States. It is a region of opportunity, not one we believe dominated by threats. 
rec recognizing Latin America's transformation and the emergence, we have outlined key, four key pillars through which we believe the United States administration and Congress can engage the region. These include first, unleashing the U.S. private sector. Second, collaborating in the fight against uh, organized crime and impunity. Third, seizing on the value of regional integration. And fourth, embracing Latin America's global emergence to work with the region and a host of issues of mutual concern around the world. Now, building on these four, building these four strategic pillars, we have then provided ideas on how to work in an engaging fashion with specific countries in the region, specifically Mexico, but also Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, the three Northern Triangle countries, Cuba, and Argentina. We look at this paper as, as a blueprint, and we invite others to take ideas from it and run with it as if your own. We, plagiarism copying of our paper, we, we encourage. Please, please feel free to take our ideas, make them your ideas, and run with it, because we believe it gives a lot of fodder moving forward. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave it at this high-level overview of our four to your approach to engagement with the region. But again, I encourage you to read more. It's a short 35 pages, uh, and the papers, again, are available right outside here. But before passing the mic, I'd like to dig just for one moment into one crucial con country that we discussed in our strategy report, which I'm sure will come as no surprise to all of you, and that's Mexico. Mexico is a longtime partner of the United States that came under fire in the campaign and continues to bear the brunt of the new administration's desire to remake existing relationships. Following last month's visit by Secretaries Tillerson and Kelly to Mexico, we were all left wondering what might happen next between the United States and our important partner to the South. And the rest of Latin America as well is closely watching what happens with the U.S. and Mexico. There is no doubt Mexico has been our side over the past few decades, especially so since the 1990s. Our ties have propelled exports across the United States, created millions of U.S. jobs, and kept our country safer through intelligence sharing and border cooperation. In a world of chaos, the strong working, with, working relationship with Mexico has been critical to making sure that U.S. security starts far away from our actual southern border. Our economic and business relationship is strong. $1.5 billion crosses the Rio Grande every single day. A number I'm sure all of you have heard more than once these days. With jobs from Iowa to Michigan dependent on our trade with Mexico. But these positive realities have unfortunately received very little attention these days. In fact, Mexico is now being made out to be a danger to the United States, and that is, detriment and that is detrimental to Americans as well as detrimental to Mexicans at the same time. We cannot risk the long-term consequences of fracturing a relationship with one of our closest allies. Our speakers today will talk much more in depth about what has happened and what's to come. But first, in helping to paint the larger regional over overview, it's hard to get a more insightful speaker than Ambassador Thomas Pickering, uh, somebody who is working with uh, our center on a number of things from our Columbia Task Force to our Northern Triangle Task Force. Ambassador Pickering is a fountain of knowledge on all things foreign policy. He has served for more than four decades as a U.S. Diplomat. diplomat. He is a renowned voice on U.S. foreign policy, having served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, as well as countless ambassadors ambassadorships, to the, from the United, including the United Nations, uh, the Russian Federation, India, Israel, Jordan, El Salvador, Nigeria, and Ambassador Pickering. I might even be met, missing a few. Ambassador Pickering, welcome. It's a great honor to have you. We look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Adrian Arsht. Um, Washington is a funny town. And I'm in this invidious position of <clears throat> looking at what I used to call the curse of the Congress. Everything's been said, but not everybody has said it yet. So I'm going to be very short today because I think Jason has given you a wonderful introduction to where we are and how we're looking at things. I have three or four very simple points to make to you. Latin America is always under dealt with by the United States, and we have a new opportunity to further open the doors to the hemisphere uh, and the hemisphere to us. Secondly, it's an extremely important set of partnerships from Mexico to Argentina in terms of trade and investment, of shared interest in democracy, 
of common cooperation in many areas. It is a region that I think is perhaps today more open to us and to where we're going than we have seen for some time. Uh, but all comparisons are, of course, invidious. Uh, we have problems in the region, and we cannot skirt over those. And I think the report does an excellent job at looking at both the problems and the opportunities in the region. One only has to mention Venezuela. Uh, as perhaps first in line in the problem relationship. But one can look at countries like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, not without problems for us, but also providing us with great opportunities. And it is in that direction that I think we want to look this morning. Uh, the report says much, Jason has said much, and our panel coming up will say a great deal about Mexico in the United States. It is an honor and a pleasure for us to have here Margarita Zavala, uh, a key contender uh, for the presidency of her country uh, in the year ahead, and someone who knows much and will tell us much about her country uh, and the uh, enormous, and I think committed, sense she feels uh, to Mexico, and through that I hope Margarita to the U.S.-Mexican relationship. And we're very pleased and delighted to have uh, Secretary Michael Chertoff, whose uh, work and interest and indeed association uh, with Mexico, the border, and, and the trenchant problems that we have seen and had together is an important contribution uh, to this morning's discussion. I'll just say one more simple word, el muro. <laughs> it struck me always as a solution in search of a problem. And it may be that migration with the cooperation of Mexico is better solved without concrete, but with human dimensions foremost. Uh, at the moment, the statistics show us that the wall is better designed to keep Mexicans in America, which is the general flow outward, than the alternative. And we need to look at that. Uh, if the wall will help in the illegal export of firearms, then maybe it will serve a purpose. But I hasten to say that service may be better served by actions not relating to concrete and, mor and mortar, but let's debate the subject. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Peter Schechter, who is going to take the floor next to run the panel. Peter runs the Adrian R. Center. And thank you, Adrian R. Center, for gathering us together and making Latin America so important in the work of the Atlantic Council and what goes on here in Washington. Ambassador Pickering, thank you for those very, very kind words. Good morning, everybody. I'm Peter Schechter. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Atlantic Council. I'm also the director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. And a word to Adrian again to thank you for making all of this possible. There's over uh, 200 people in this room today. It's an important cross-section of the administration, of Congress, think tanks, press, the private sector. Your presence here is proof of the depth of appreciation for, but also the concern with, our relation with Mexico. We at the Atlantic Council believe that a strong U.S.-Mexican alliance is the key to stability, security, and prosperity, not only on, along the border, but in, for our country here in the United States. Since the presidential campaign, a rift has developed between the United States and Mexico, and the rift is widening. The wall, immigration, detentions, the threats to NAFTA are forcing Mexicans everywhere to ask themselves the unimaginable question, which is, did we Mexicans make a mistake 25 years ago by betting our future on NAFTA? We saw massive marches last weekend in the, in, against the United States. The leftist candidate, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is rising in national polls. Mexico's Congress is considering bills to limit the purchase of U.S. agricultural products and force the purchase of Argentine and Brazilian corn, wheat, and, uh, and, and soy. 
This is so unfortunate because over the past 25 years, the U.S.-Mexican relationship has grown and flourished. U.S.-Mexico U.S. and Mexico cooperate in one of the most efficient borders in the world. We, beyond the border, U.S. national security interests are benefited by increased cooperation in intelligence sharing, <laughs> anti-narcotics enforcement, maritime security, and of course all the work that Mexico does on its southern border to stem the flow of Central American migrants to the United States. Needless to say, as Jason has mentioned, as Ambassador Pickering has, has added, NAFTA supports 14 million jobs here in the United States. So before the rift goes further, it is now more important than ever that we have a frank and open conversation about how decisions are made by leaders in the United States and Mexico and how those decisions are going to impact the economy, the security, and the prosperity of our two countries. I would just point to an opening salvo in that frank discussion that Margarita Zavala has penned in today's Washington Post. Next year, Mexico will elect a new president. What happens between the United States and Mexico is undoubtedly going to affect the political campaign. The political quicksands are going to be very tricky. That is why we're so lucky to have you, Margarita, here today, along with Secretary Chertoff, to talk about the future of this crucial partnership. Margarita Zavala is a leading contender for the presidency of Mexico, a member of the National Action Party, the PAN. She served as First Lady of Mexico alongside former President Felipe Calderón from 2006 to 2012. She was previously a federal deputy where she was the sub-coordinator of social policy of the PAN parliamentary group. Michael Chertoff is the founder and executive chairman of the Chertoff Group and a senior counsel at Covington and Burling. He served as the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security under President George Bush from 2005 to 2009, where he led and strengthened crucial aspects of border security. Few people know the U.S.-Mexican relations as closely as Secretary Chertoff. Before heading the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Chertoff was appointed as the Assistant Attorney General of the United States for the Criminal Division. It's an immense pleasure to have both of you here today. And I've asked both of you privately, and I'm going to ask you publicly, that the more you f make me fade out of this discussion, the happier I'm going to be. I, um, I'd love to just let you have a dialogue. So I'm just going to kick it off. We're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about security. We're going to talk about trade. And perhaps we'll have time to also talk about the broader diplomatic context of this uh, of the, and geostrategic uh, issue of this, of this rift between our countries. I want to leave also time for questions at the end. But I, I, I'd love for you, you've just come from, from Mexico, I'd love you to describe a little bit what's the mood of your country. When one travels to Mexico these days, there's little other in the news other than President Trump. Um, describe to us what is the feeling today there? What's, how is, what are the repercussions of this earthquake? What are policymakers, what are companies saying, and what are people saying on the streets? And what are your fears and hopes for what is happening uh, between Mexico and the United States. You all have um, um, interpreters' uh, headphones. Margarita will speak in, in Spanish. Spanish okay. Welcome again. Thank you. Perdón. Gracias. Gracias por la Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here this morning. If you didn't believe that this relationship was important, we'd have an empty room. I see that you, um, your presence here means a lot to the U.S. and to Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here um, with all your knowledge. Um, and I see so many people here and know a great deal. Thank you. I began my career in politics at age 16 back in the 80s. I, at that time, the relationship was very difficult between the U.S. and Mexico, U.S. and Central America, and there was also uh, the difficult time associated with the killing of a DEA agent. At the time, 
that the situation was one of threat and concern about the relationship, something that we're seeing a resurgence of right now. The relationship is much more complex than it was back then. At the, t at the time, we had not just migration, but we had trade relations, borders, security. Now, what is the feeling now? Clearly, there's a strong tension. But what are the, the risks? What are the threats? I mean, we have here a, a rhetoric of, of hate coming from the President of the United States that began in the campaign. Back in 2015, I had an article um, in the newspaper titled, Taking Trump Seriously, because it's important to take that kind of rhetoric seriously because of what it gives rise to. And that's the risk that we're seeing in Mexico. Now, as when I first entered politics, there was negative sentiment against the U.S. Back then, the ruling party, the PRI, which is authoritarian, had used the U.S. as a scapegoat. They were at fault for everything. They, the, the conquistadors and the U.S. were to blame for everything. What managed to dilute that negative sentiment? Well, first of all, a free trade agreement, lively trade relationships. Products began to move. People began to move, not just in terms of migration, but also we started seeing um, companies and boards and different associations working across the border. Uh, I mentioned in an article that we had 23 million LF NFL fans in Mexico watching the Dallas-Pittsburgh game. And whether you're talking about that or guacamole, internet, telecommunications, the U.S. has become part of Mexico, and Mexico has become part of the U.S. The relationship has, has been building, and so that anti-U.S. sentiment started to disappear. Another really, there's something else that's really essential to that, and that is also in jeopardy now, and that was democracy. Democracy arrived in Mexico, and that softened that need for an external enemy, because democracy forces you to think about yourself and your own country and solve your own problems. That, too, is now in jeopardy. The U.S. needs to decide, how is it going to treat us? Are we partners and allies? Then treat us that way. There's danger if, you, if we treat each other like enemies, then we're going to lose 25 years of a healthy relationship. This is something that goes beyond just a simple tweet or just one person. There are institutions, and I will do everything possible to ensure that we have a constructive relationship that is beneficial to both our countries and the region in all areas, migration, security, security environment, friendship. So, Mr. Secretary, let's talk about politics at home before we get into the, the I mean, the, the President Trump continues to make Mexico one of his main negative themes. Uh, he, while somewhat more oblique, he did it again in the speech that he did delivered to Congress just a few days ago. And there's so many stakeholders in this relationship, governors and mayors. I've heard you speak uh, about how importantly how important state governors and 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 and, and states are al along the border. But not only border states that, because lots of states have Mexico as the first or second export market. Uh, companies, U.S. companies have made major investments in Mexico. There's the whole national security apparatus from the CIA uh, to the DEA, which has intensified over the years its cooperation with Mexico. And there's so many cultural and historical ties. 
There is a sense in this country that those stakeholders aren't, we're not hearing them. Tell us a little bit about how, how we can we can get them more heard, or is it possible to get them more heard? Well, well first of all, let me uh, uh, welcome Margarita. It's wonderful Thank to you. have you here. And um, I, I enjoyed when I was in office working with President Calderon, who was a, a great friend of the United States. And I also thank you to Adrian for, for sponsoring this. Um, I had the you know great opportunity both at the Department of Justice and at the Department of Homeland Security to work with my counterparts in Mexico. And they were really among our strongest allies and friends from a national security standpoint. Um, uh, we, we worked very closely, not just with respect to, to the border, but with respect to the issue of potential terrorists coming into the hemisphere. There was a lot of information sharing and a lot of cooperation on that. Um, the challenge is this. We are in a very strange time in the West. It's not limited to the United States. You see it in, in Europe as well. Uh, and part of that is the rise of xenophobia. And it's not just the question of what President Trump says about Mexicans. It's what's said about Muslims. It's what's said about all kinds of people from other parts of the world. And we see in Europe as well the rise of populism as a kind of xenophobic force. So this is clearly part of a larger trend. And I, I, I'm a little concerned we may see that in Mexico as well, both as a reaction to what's happening in the US, but as part of the broader trend. Uh, the question is, how do, you, how do you challenge this? And I will say, when I got into office at Homeland Security, uh, the president, having been a governor of Texas and someone who was raised in Texas, had a very strong feeling about the importance of the relationship with Mexico, because he and many of the people he grew up with lived with Mexico as a trading partner, as a place where they had social relationships, where they visited, where people visited us. And if you go down to uh, border regions, not everybody has the same view, but you'll find a lot of people who really cherish this relationship. The question is, how do you get the message out? And you know, uh, part of this is really a matter for people who are expert in, in public affairs. We are now living in a very challenging period where getting the facts and the truth out is by no means easy. And a lot of the argument now takes place in a plane in which you might say there's a fact-free zone. Uh, one of the things I, I think is important is to get more of the folks who are actually in the area dealing with Mexico, part of that ecosystem. Get them out there in the news media. Get them out there uh, on the social media. Let them explain to colleagues in other parts of the country and, uh, and fellow citizens how important and how mutual this relationship is. And then it should not only just be Texas and Arizona and California and New Mexico, but those parts of the country, Iowa, which export um, uh, grain and corn to Mexico, uh, companies that are manufacturing that export um, products to Mexico and then get them back and there's a binary relationship. We need to get stories out there about that so there's a greater understanding of the fact that Mexico is not just our neighbor, but one of our closest allies and friends. Thank you. Margarita, I've, I've, I've heard you speak passionately and, I, and you, you, you mentioned it in your article today in the Washington Post about how you are concerned that this not only affects the government to government relationship, but also could potentially cascade into the relationship between people and, and how uh, Mexico in many ways is the first line of defense on unauthorized migration or even on organized crime. H how do you see this rift also endangering sort of the relationship between people and, and it's not only the, between the two presidents, but how does this relationship also cascade and how is that going to affect our own security cooperation? Well, that is exactly what's in jeopardy beyond our friendly, friendly relations or not. But there are some very important issues at hand. The matter of the wall, as the ambassador so eloquently stated, this is something that needs to be pointed out because of what it symbolically represents. That, yes, there's already a physical wall or fence since the 90s, but now 
there's a, a backdrop to here. There's hate, xenophobia, racism that is, you know, it's the, about the neighboring country, but it's also Muslims or whoever the scapegoat needs to be. It's important for Mexico to be very clear about saying, of course, we're not going to pay for the wall. And I don't know why anyone would want to pay for something as useless and expensive as a border wall. It's very important for us to be clear on that and that we point out what it means. What is in jeopardy? It will, and the secretary knows very well that security, our shared security concerns and threats, there is a threat that it, when we talk about border security, that is very important for us, and it's very important for the U.S. as well. And in fact, this is a border where Nobody who has committed a terrorist act in the United States crossed the U.S.-Mexican border. There is a strong relationship at the border between Mexico and the United States, and the consequences of this are important for the security of the region, not just the U.S., but for the region as a whole. We need to make people understand this. People in the United States have to understand that the good relationships or bad relationships have their consequences, economic consequences. As the secretary stated in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, uh, we are their main export destination, and many of their jobs depend on us vice versa, but there are other states as well whose economies depend greatly on the exports of grains. Thousands of jobs are created through trade. You have already mentioned the 14 million jobs that rely on our relations. And what is spent in the United States every year by Mexican tourists this has an impact on security. It has an impact on the economy, trade relations. It is true that we need a clear communication strategy in a very difficult moment where demagogy and misinformation can prevail. At the end of the day, intelligence and reason is strategically employed can win. And this is something that we can do. What does all of this mean? Difficult situations are only surmounted through courage. On the political side, it's true. And perhaps that's the most responsible course of action. But economically speaking as well, the private sector, investment funds, universities, heads of schools, families, religious organizations, we have to be very clear about what's in jeopardy in our country and in the United States. Just take you know three examples of things in which you know this cooperation has been so important for our security, uh, and these are not necessarily well known or, or reported widely. But uh, when I was in office, and I think uh, uh, former Ambassador Medina Moore was then Attorney General. Uh, we actually had a protocol <clears throat> between the U.S. Border Patrol and their Mexican counterparts that when there were issues where smugglers, for example, were uh, shooting across the border or undertaking some kind of threat to our Border Patrol, we coordinated very closely <clears throat> with Mexican counterparts to make sure that we were addressing that issue and removing the threat. So the cooperation back and forth, even across that border, was something that actually enhanced the safety and security of our Border Patrol as it did for, for uh, the Mexican authorities. Second thing, <clears throat> as was just said, and I can't underscore it enough, uh, to my knowledge, we've not had a single case of a terrorist, uh, uh, a violent jihadi terrorist coming across the southern border. Um, and that is significantly due to, again, very close intelligence cooperation we have had with the Mexican authorities in terms of who is coming into Mexico whether they become they be 
uh, are trying to enter by air or trying to go through the southern border. And that's, again, an area we've cooperated because we recognize a lot of the migration into the US actually doesn't come from Mexico. It comes through Mexico. And of course, uh, the smuggling often comes through Mexico. And so we work together on that. <clears throat> Finally, in a, in a different plane, um, I remember after Hurricane Katrina, the Mexicans uh, were among the, the first to come forward with people to help with the restoration, with assistance to help with the restoration. Because like good neighbors, when they see you know, your house is on fire or your house is damaged, they come and help you stop the fire and rebuild the damage. So we have had this very close relationship. And I wish we could publicize it more. Unfortunately, good news stories tend not to get as much play as bad news stories. But again, I think this is part of communicating the, the richness of that relationship. Yeah, Margarita, I, I want, before we leave politics and talk a little bit about trade and NAFTA, <laughs> I, I want to press you on the presidential election. You're obviously a, a candidate, and uh, all of this rift is somehow feeding the, the candidacy of uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador. Um, how, could, could you describe to us how the, the, this connection happens? And we, what are the dangers that this rift continues and that we have a strengthened candidacy? And how will that affect your candidacy? I hate to be so directly talking about elections, but your elections is also important for us. Well, I, I understand perfectly. It's not just a matter of names. It's countries. This is a matter that has an impact on future relations and the future of us all. What is Mexico going to decide and under what conditions are Mexicans going to make their decision? That's why it's important for us to strengthen the relations between the U.S. and Mexico. That would help us to ensure that the discourse is far more rational and sensible in Mexico. As far as what's happening in Mexico, beyond the U.S. elections, even before Trump was elected, what we've seen is there has been a lot of economic uncertainty. This has to do with a lack of responsibility as far as public finances are concerned. There's this second feeling of anger and indignation with respect to corruption. Also, uh, this feeling that there's a lack of security because there's a lack of rule of law. So these three feelings that uh, are based on democracy, public finances, honesty, transparency, rule of law, of course, these uh, be worsen because of the hateful rhetoric that is having an impact on the relations between the U.S. and Mexico. Of course, we need change. This is clear. However, what's important is to ensure that whatever change occurs has to be responsible. It has to be a change in public policy that are reasoned and rational. But what we can't do is just leap into demagogy, because that puts us all in jeopardy. This rhetoric of hate, it might work at the outset. And it might convince people. We've seen this in France. It worked in the case of Brexit. We have to be far more astute and uh, follow the path of rationality. We have to ensure that we are speaking clearly. There has to be greater intervention, far more involvement. I believe that we can convince people that they can make good decisions. And Mexico is right now deciding on moving backwards into the past, going back to old enemies. It, but it has to do with what's happening here. 
I look at the case of Venezuela as the ambassador Pickering brought that up. Venezuela, not long ago, was the richest country in Latin America. Not long ago, it was an exemplary democracy. It took in refugees from dictatorships from the left and the right. And because things were quite complicated at that time. Nevertheless, people did not understand the risk of having someone like Hugo Chavez in office. There was uh, major levels of authoritarianism, a lot of confrontation. And then, of course, after Chavez came Maduro, which is even worse. The United States has to take a look at this. We all have to bear this into account. What do we want from our neighbors? What do we want for the region? And I'm going to go back and revisit what the secretary said. These issues go far beyond just politics. It's about money laundering, hurricanes, earthquakes, and 2018, which is when the presidential elections will be held in Mexico, they may be marked by polarization, hate, the relaxation of public policies having to do with security or trade, and we all lose if that's the case. There are also things that we need to learn from history. People don't change and even less when they come to power. Just give me one example, one story where somebody has reversed their position once they got into office. I have seen power close up. And the impact become more entrenched any of these qualities that are accompanied by passion for pol politics and uh, the vocation of service, those also become more entrenched. But nobody changes. You don't have somebody who says that they're, who shows that they're going to be a dictator, who gets to office and decides not to be. So we have to be responsible when we're making decisions, not just when we're voting, but with every word we use, every comment we make, every time we attend something, every time we applaud for something. We have to be very careful. This is our future and the future of those that come after us. The larger message, you know, beyond just what happens in Mexico with this, which is, again, as we've seen throughout the West, uh, you can't take for granted that, as, as someone once said, the arc of history is headed in the direction of democracy and freedom. It's not happening by itself. It requires engagement by people. And I think we've all had um, some surprising um, occurrences in the last few years that make us realize that you can't simply sit on your hands. You have to be engaged. I would also say, again, on the region, um, you know, it's not just we have to look, at, as, um, as we just said, beyond simply Mexico and the U.S. Uh, Venezuela has become uh, a, a, a not a very good story. On the positive side, Colombia. I remember when I was a young prosecutor, Colombia was viewed as the Wild West, and now it is a stable, prosperous, rule of law society. So there are positive things, too. I think both of our countries have to look to Central America. There are now very weak states, states where transnational criminal groups are very powerful. We see this with gangs. Uh, and we need to make sure that that is not becoming a problem for both of our countries. And again, this is an area where we need to be cultivating our friends. Last point I would say on an optimistic note, uh, my successor, the current secretary, John Kelly, was the head of Southcom. Uh, and that means he has a real understanding of the larger dimensions of the hemisphere and how that plays not only with our security but with our migration. So I'm hopeful that with uh, the people who actually are involved operationally in re representing the U.S. government that we can continue at least to build on an operational level on some very strong relationships. And then if we can kind of get the rhetoric toned down, maybe we can avoid doing uh, real damage.
Well, let me, I was gonna move to NAFTA, but you, you, brought, you brought up this larger dimension, and I think that what, let's jump right in there, and you talked about Colombia and some of the success there. Uh, in, in the paper that, that, uh, that Jason and I and Rachel rele released today, we talk about opportunities, but we also talk about the, some of the dangers of these rifts and other geopolitical uh, players who will certainly take advantage of these rifts. What, what are some of the biggest concerns you see there, particularly with how does China fill in a vacuum that <coughs> the U.S. Is, is leaving? I mean, already China is the largest uh, trading partner of a number of Latin American par uh, countries. Not with Mexico, sure. but does this? Do you feel that this rift also opens a door to other political players? I, I think it does. I mean, I think that you know, if you if you are concerned about the U.S. economy growing, um, you, you have to recognize if you have any kind of economic literacy that exports are a big part of that. The Chinese recognize that. In Africa, they they've really tried to insert themselves. The Russians are now trying to build an economic sphere around their country. The Chinese are building this this new Silk Road and Belt in Asia. I'm quite sure that both Russia and China would love to be welcomed into the Western Hemisphere and basically eat our economic lunch, as well as create a more uh, uh, somewhat closer potential security set of issues. So again, having Strong relationships in our neighborhood are very important. One thing I would mention about Venezuela is, uh, I remember some years back, direct flights began between Iran and Caracas. Yes. And that is a security issue for the United States. And that brings into our hemisphere um, people that are uh, adversaries, to say the least, of, of America. On the other hand, when we've had cooperation, like with Mexico, um, that has made a huge difference. So I think from a, an economic and security standpoint, we should recognize we are not the only game in town. And if we back away, particularly in a, in a, in a hostile way, we're opening the door to our rivals. I don't know, Margarita, if you want to add something to that. I think that's something that certainly concerns many of us in the foreign policy establishment about how some of these rifts that are developing, let's take the Mexican one, how this, does it open up opportunities for other players? Russia, China, Middle Eastern players. Does, is that something that we in America should worry about? Well, first, I wanted to refer to the matter of Central America. I have spent 10 years looking at migration and immigrants, this matter of unaccompanied minors who are forcefully uh, moved through Central America, Mexico, and the United States, and the relationships with Central America are very important for Mexico, of course, as well as for the United States. Since 2009, migration from Mexico to the United States is actually negative. It's net negative. Uh, the migratory flows primarily come from the three countries of the Northern Triangle because of violence. So it's not about building walls to separate people like the U.S. is proposing. It's more about the communities of origin. That's where we need to uh, invest our efforts, working with our neighbors in Central America, because if we do so, this will mean greater security for all countries, for Mexico, for the United States, and will also prevent some of this great human suffering that our neighbors are experiencing. As to trade relations, we live in a globalized world, economically speaking. So the vacuums are going to be filled by somebody. I know that we're not precisely off the record. No, in fact, we're precisely on the record here. Let's just say that international meetings like APEC Uh, uh, right after the inauguration, uh, the uh, dismantling of TPP, uh, NAFTA, the discussions about NAFTA, uh, these are part of global 
uh, trade relations. And China is going to do whatever it can to occupy these vacuums left behind by the United States. And it's not just about economics. It's about security. It's um, cultural. There are cultural aspects. Who do we want our neighbor to be engaging with? If we want to enhance relations, what risks does this entail? And of course, the United States trying to isolate itself, which is part of this wall, it's trying to isolate itself, isolate America. Somebody is going to come in to take its place. And it may be very uncomfortable for the United States. So we have to look much more broadly. There has to be a greater vision. Look at the urgency of what's happening now, but also think in the long term and what we want for our countries in the long run. And, and talk a little bit about that, because I mean, we, we do have a profound economic integration between our two countries. And I have a whole series, bunch of questions on that, and, and I guess, the first one is, um, is, is NAFTA fixable? I mean, the, 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 the question is, do we have to destroy NAFTA, or is NAFTA, can NAFTA be updated and modernized, as a lot of people are suggesting? The second question is, is NAFTA even possible? I mean, it's the, the president and some of the administration seems to repeatedly believe in more bilateral relations than multilateral relations, and do you see the United States is attempting to exclude Mexico from a new bilateral relations with Canada. Do you think Canada will play ball with that? It's a lot of questions I'm throwing at you, but so I, I preface it by saying I'm not I, I'm not a trade per lawyer, or, or you know I did participate in the uh, uh, trilateral meetings with President Bush and and his counterparts from Canada and Mexico. Um, but but I would say this, um, you know, and again I, I do think sometimes the rhetoric. It, 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 that we hear from the White House exceeds the actual policy. Um, I think that the issue about multilateral arrangements probably is more directed at these large arrangements involving maybe a dozen countries where you have a lot of different moving parts. I mean, after we're talking about three countries, uh, all neighbors. Um, is there room for updating and modernizing? I'm sure there is. I'm sure the Mexicans have some things and the Canadians as well that they'd like to adjust. Um, I don't think it'd be, it would be complicated to do that. And whether you sequence it by having some, some bilateral discussions and then ending with all three, I think is more a, a tactical question. Um, I can't tell you whether the Canadians would um, essentially you know, kind of try to go it alone. I suspect not, because I suspect there's quite a bit of trade going, going that way as well. But you know, we're all in a very small area. It's very hard to live in an isolated way. And as, I, as we said earlier, if you look at those economies that are based either on the close proximity to the border or exports, they can't afford to have a major disruption. But again, it's going to require that the, that the members of Congress and the other stakeholders who have a, a real vested interest in having a viable, mutually beneficial NAFTA, they have to get out there and talk about it and they have to be engaged on that. Margarita, you, you spoke on television, I think, a few weeks ago in Mexico, and you, you talked about trying to be creative with solutions for NAFTA and how do we move forward. Do you want to take this opportunity and talk a little bit about what are these, some of these creative solutions that you see in trying to move NAFTA forward into something that all three countries will be happy with? Well, firstly, NAFTA gave rise to relationships among the three countries that go beyond the economic realm. Obviously, over 20 years ago, the issues were different. There are many issues Mexico's fine with, but sure, there are other things that some would like to see updated. Uh, at the time that NAFTA was drafted, there weren't social networks. The internet 
and it, the electronic world and telecommunications didn't look like they do now, of uh, clean energy that have been developed. It's all different, but that doesn't require that agreement to be torn up. And I think it would be terrible to send a new agreement to our respective Senates with all the tensions that we're seeing right now. I mean, if you think about what it would look like, sending these agreements back to Congress, we'd effectively be paralyzing the trade relationship. Mexico has requested specific up updates when it has um, had issues. Uh, there were cases brought in the issue of tomatoes and, and tuna where it felt like it wasn't being treated fairly. But the agreement itself has mechanisms for raising issues when a country has them. There are mechanisms that enable negotiations so that everything's in the best interest of the parties. I do not believe that Mexico should step out of NAFTA. I guess the United States has to decide, does it or does it not want to be part of this? Does it want to be a trade partner with Mexico? Does it want to be a trade partner with Canada? And I guess it, it really, I mean, there have been updates. The rules of origin were changed. Those things can be discussed along with other specific issues, but there is no need to tear up the agreement itself. Now having said that, with or without NAFTA, the two countries have trade with one another. That exists. How many billions of dollars cross the border every day? There is no other example of two countries with this level of trade in the world. There will be trade. Either the terms will be good or there won't be or we'll have to turn to the WTO. I don't know. In terms of challenges for Mexico, yes, we need to further diversify our exports and diversify our imports because what the trade agreement does is facilitate a number of things. We have free trade agreements, not just with the U.S., but with 44 other countries. And the Mexican government has the challenge of strengthening the business export sector and seeking further diversification. I don't think we need to go into the details, but that is a challenge. What I want to say is that this whole situation has, forces, has forced Mexico to really see itself as a people that need to make decisions, and it's forcing us to look inward and see how we can solve our problems, because others won't do it. Uh, on that last thing, which was I mean, somebody has said to us uh, uh, a few weeks ago that nothing has helped national unity in Mexico more than this <laughs> problem, more than the problem with the United States. Is that true? Yes, it's true. It's true that adversity can bring us together, although internally we're clear on our difference is unity doesn't mean that impunity is okay. It doesn't mean we don't need to solve our problems. Unity doesn't mean that we are unaware of the lack of the rule of law. It doesn't mean that people don't feel indignant as regards corruption or, or the fears regarding security. That's a different matter, and it's important to make that distinction. But there is truth in that. I would rather that we unite around ideas and thoughts and visions and not around a conflict with the U.S., or as John F. Kennedy said, it's, it, it's all... It's about building bridges, not walls. 
security question that I really want to ask you. You, you. you built a large part of the border that Thank is you. there now. You, you told me <coughs> privately, and I hope I'm not telling a story, that you even welded a part of it. I did, yeah. Uh, um, and and what, other, uh, what are the solutions to the wall issue? How, how can we enhance security at the border without creating a wall that is so offensive yeah to Mexico and, and to Mexicans. So, so um, I think we have to acknowledge that it's a fair expectation on the part of American citizens that they will control who enters the country, whether it's at the airport or the land port or the, or the sea border. And ideally, in, in my view, and we try to do this under President Bush, we would have a, a series of welcoming bridges or doors that would be open. But, but again, it would be the US that would decide who to admit and who not to admit. Um, the way the border works um, in terms of topography is this. There are some parts of the border where the distance between the border and a city or a major highway is very short. When I went down to Yuma uh, early in my tenure, basically to get to Yuma from the border is a little less than a quarter of a mile. And literally you could see hundreds of people on the other side of the border. Um, and they would run across the border because there was no way the border patrol could intercept them. And then once they entered the city, it was impossible to locate anybody who'd come across illegally. So we built fencing there, and that stopped it. Basically, you, you went from hundreds a day to maybe two or three a day. Because getting over the wall or getting over the fence took enough time that with surveillance, uh, you know, video, radar, the Border Patrol could deploy and get there in time to intercept. And that actually had a deterrent effect. Now, that works at about 700 miles of the border. We've got about 650 miles of fencing. And by the way, you don't want a wall because you want to see through it, so you want a fence. Um, and then you have to make arrangements for gates when people want to, for example, if they're, you're by the river and they want to graze their cattle and have their cattle watered, they want to be able to go back and forth. But largely what you want in the border, other than that, is you want to have uh, various kinds of technology that alert you whether someone is trying to smuggle either people or contraband across the border. And as someone said, I think, earlier, uh, ideally also it works if people are trying to smuggle guns into Mexico because, to be fair, a lot of the crime problem and the violence problem there has come from American guns moving south into Mexico. So it, it's about having a mix of technology and infrastructure that it's not going to stop people from coming, but what it will do is it'll slow it up and give you an opportunity to, to intercept. Now, the ideal solution, which I used to argue for, was this. To the extent people from, whether it be Mexico or Latin America or elsewhere, want to do temporary work in the US, we ought to have a program that allows them to come in, they get a visa, they get identified, they come and go as they please, they can send remittances back. That's going to take the vast majority of people who are crossing and put them into a legal channel, a door or a bridge rather than a wall. Then you're going to have some people who want to do bad stuff, and they're smuggling drugs or, or other things. And that's where you want to focus your attention. And that's where this kind of, of capability is really its most important use. So you know, the, the sad thing is um, I've been through maybe two decades now of iterations about how we might bring all of the solutions together to both deal with our labor needs in the US, but also to make security easier and more efficient. And everybody winds up with the same solution. It's a mix of having a legal channel for work and then devoting our resources to people who want to come in or go out for illegal purposes. And uh, the frustrating thing, to be honest, is um, if we could get by the rhetoric and just fix the problem, we could eliminate uh, this constant irritant. Yes, people asked me when I was coming here, how could you come here and talk to somebody who built a fence? But I am aware of the work he's done with regard to Mexico. Um, in Mexico, we, you know, we're aware of where physical divisions make sense. Nowadays, in the 21st century, it's it's strange that somebody would choose something so physical, something so brick and mortar. 
to to create that boundary as as President Trump has suggested, and it's so expensive and and symbolically, it's it's powerful. And what underlies that decision? It's that rhetoric of of hatred, something that goes beyond just the rational look at how to organize um, migration and to separate legal from illegal immigration. It's that rhetoric. But that rhetoric won't prov shouldn't prevent people from understanding everything that Mexico has contributed to the United States historically, culturally, the millions of Mexican Americans who are in this country working uh, the, their honest lives to support and enhance this country, people who love the U.S., who have become citizens. You can't cast all of that aside. And we need to stop associating the word migration with such negative concepts as drugs, organized crime, and terrorism, because that's not where the problems lie. We're not going to solve the weighty issues of the day through by, by hating others. We have specific issues, but they can be addressed through many institutions, not limited to the executive. There's the Congress as well. I was a member of Congress and served in different rules. I was involved in reforming the migration law in 2011. And that law recognized the principles of the um, in best interests of the child and family reunification. And now um, Guatemalans don't need a special visa to be able to come in and work. And, and having those things in place makes us safer. It's in the best interest of our people if we focus on real security issues and not just putting up a wall and saying, oh, that's going to solve all our problems. It's quite the contrary. That's going to lead to more violence. For a legal lane. Yeah, and, and I, I really think this is important. I mean, I think, the, you know, the, it was really distressing to hear uh, a suggestion that most or all migrants, you know, even if they're coming across without authorization, are criminals. That's completely wrong. If you look at the people who are coming across to work, by and large, mm -hmm. what they're doing, they're coming to do hard work for generally low pay so they can send money home to their families. And when they're not working, they're going to church. So I'm saying to myself, what is, why, why do we not like this? These are the kind of people we want to have. Now, obviously, the rule of law is important, and when people you know, break the law, you can't ignore it, and there's got to be some remedy for that. But surely the character of the people who are coming by and large, you know, there's some exceptions, but there are exceptions for people born here, too. By and large, they're good people. And if we could focus on the problem people, whether they are, are born overseas or born here, you know, down the street, then we could actually apply our resources more effectively. <coughs> I've monopolized this conversation long enough, so I'll open it to questions. I will take a couple of questions at a time. I think that's more helpful to Margarita for the translation as well. So uh, let me begin with Paula Stern. Again, thank you very much for a, a really important um, uh, discussion that is filling what has been a vacuum so far in terms of uh, U.S. Uh, policy discussions. Um, we have not really even begun to think about the second and third order effects of the rhetoric that has come from um, our um, uh, uh, president. Um, my question's about energy, because energy has been such an important 
part of the exchange uh, between the U.S. and Mexico, but really is not part of the NAFTA negotiations. Energy is basically um, really not been subject to trade rules um, as we know it within the uh, context of the World Trade Organization. But I understand that Mexico feels that energy should be um, uh, taken into any new discussion uh, bilaterally or trilaterally within uh, the NAFTA or separate. Uh, can you comment on that, please? I mean, there is a lonely hand that I've seen back there in the, in the corner that I would that has been raised for a while, all the way back. Thank you, Josefina Orsais. The wall discussion is no longer rhetoric. There is an RFP out for it, so it's a fact. What do you reckon, Margarita, that Mexico has done wrong since the sign of NAFTA? And what would you do different if you were to become president? Let me take one more on this side. Um, this gentleman here. Hi, thank you. Uh, Rafael Bernal from The Hill. Um, you are running against a, uh, a populist, uh, nationalist, basically so somebody who's the kind of person who's winning elections these days in, in the West, as Mr. Chertoff was saying. What, what is the strategy to effectively communicate sort of this more wonky, public policy-centered uh, campaign and, and actually win that? Okay, so three questions, one on energy. One is about what did Mexico do wrong to uh, get to the point of the wall and how, what will you do to change that? And the third question is how do you win against the populist if you're a wonky, a ver como se traduce wonky, um, serio, estudioso, if you're a studious, serious person who wants to engage in serious debate, how do you defeat a populist? Okay, well, first to energy. It's true, that is something that needs to be negotiated. The bilateral agenda between the United States and Mexico isn't limited just to NAFTA or to the wall. The wall is the result of a very tough uh, rhetoric, a negative rhetoric, but clearly there are other issues that need to be looked at and energy is one of them, no doubt. We have pipelines and power plants and that needs to be looked at. There is a bilateral commission uh, that I understand is working very well that isn't well known, but is working well. In fact, maybe that's why it's not well known, is because it's working well. But um, again, it's subject to bilateral work. Um, so yes, NAFTA isn't all there is. There are other sectors. Uh, Mexico is looking very much at, at clean energy. And I think Secretary of State Tillerson is aware of all of these issues and has had quite a bit of experience with Mexico and will no doubt be part of bilateral negotiations between the two countries, especially with a subject that is import as important as energy and giving the energy reform that is just beginning to be implemented now. Now, Josefina, <laughs> it is true that the RFP is out, that the U.S. is apparently ready to spell tw spend 20 billion pesos or dollars, rather, on such a monstrous thing. And there's not even a direct threat. It's just about 
doing it to do it. Where did we fail? Yeah, I don't want to come here and criticize, but I think that we failed in terms of having an effective strategy for changing migratory laws. For instance, there are things we could have fixed without asking for everything. I can give you an example. It's something that I think is important, and if you're Mexican or Latin American, you'll understand this. Unaccompanied minor immigrants for Mexico and for the UNHCR are kids that often come with an, an older brother. This is very common. Uh, or they're sent with an aunt or an uncle. But if you don't come with your immediate legal guardian, you're considered to be an unaccompanied minor. And then the person who's with the child can be accused of human trafficking. And it's really just a matter of interpretation. The US doesn't understand that from our perspective, that child is accompanied. A 12-year-old who comes with his 19-year-old brother is accompanied. A girl who comes with her aunt is accompanied. But here, immediately, the children are separated from from their uncle or, or aunt or brother who get locked up and then while well, the kids go to a home and then they get tried for for human smuggling or, or what have you without recognizing that family relationship. So what we really need to do is get on the same page and understand that those children are not unaccompanied. It is causing unnecessary suffering. And how often do they deport someone because they didn't realize they had papers? This happened with Guadalupe Garcia, one of um, one of the reasons they gave for deporting her. This is just a taken a recent example. Um, she didn't know that she needed to check in, and she wasn't aware of her all the legal requirements. So there are many cases that end up in the courts um, are also where a permanent resident confesses to a crime and doesn't realize that because they hadn't applied for citizenship, that is grounds for deportation. And they just get sent straight to Mexico, even if they've spent 33 years living here. Uh, just because they didn't become citizens. There are many, many Latin American immigrants. They want to come here legally. They want to walk around legally. They want to go to museums. But they don't necessarily want to be citizens, but then that immediately makes them suspicious. And we didn't ask for those things specifically. We could have. We could have perhaps prevented a lot of suffering if we had strategically focused on those things. In recent years, I, I was concerned. Um, we had four ambassadors over four years. I guess we did something wrong there. Within seven months without an ambassador, we missed something there, too. But there are also many things that we've learned and many things to learn about being a country, um, having dignified and yet firm relationships with other countries. And then there are also the relationships between the business community in the between the U.S. and Mexico, not just international trade, but more relationships between trade associations or sectors 
And some of you may say, oh, no, but we've got great relationships with companies over there. Sure, yes, that may be the case, but there's not this broader vision of the great relationships across border between companies. Um, maybe meetings where they discuss diversification of exports or imports um, or tax regimes. I, I'm going to have to interrupt. I'm so sorry, but we just wanted to have one more. Remember, there was the question of how you were going to beat the populist, right? Well, this isn't something you win alone. It's it's society wins, the environment wins. It's the responsibility of everybody. The responsibility lies with the people that applaud for hatred, that applaud for demagoguery. It's about highlighting the consequences of populism and demagoguery and decision making. I'm going to be very clear. I'm going to speak clearly as to what I feel about what the facts are and face them and just say the truth and what my vision is. I'm sure that that'll be enough. Don't underestimate the electorate. They d can be very clear, and if they have the information they need, they can make the right decision for the future. Let's begin with you. If you could make them very brief, please. <coughs> Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Leonard with Inside US Trade. I was wondering if you could comment on the sort of the Mexican officials that have been very vocal already about NAFTA and sort of the timeline, and it's unclear here because the US doesn't really have its team in place, but in Mexico it seems like there are some red lines and also a timeline given your election of when you want those talks to conclude. So since they haven't started and the, the consultation process haven't, hasn't even started, do you think there is a chance at all that you would be able to do NAFTA talks before your election, which seems to be your red line? Great, thank you. Let me take one more lady over there. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Um, I'm. Thank you, Margarita, for Em emphasizing the importance of Central America, the Mexico-Central American relations, as also part of the process of U.S.-Mexico relations, part of the discourse, and especially the, the niños crossing the border. I, w I wonder if you could go a little bit further and talk about what might be happening on the southern border of Mexico that might change the equation that thus far has allowed people to cross through, and not only Central Americans, but also Haitians and Cubans and Africans and, and others, and the relation and whether the rumor or the threat that or, or the possibility that Mexico might not allow people to be deported back to Mexico if, as you already pointed out, they don't have documentation that they are Mexican. Thank you. So those are two questions. One was on the timeline, the dates for renegotiating NAFTA, and then the matter of the southern border. Border and what issues that brings up for the United States. But Margarita, why don't you go first? A NAFTA negotiations will occur, perhaps not with the urgency that Mexico would have liked because we have elections in a year and a half. It's difficult to know now how the change in administrations will have an influence, but it's a good reason to extend negotiations of the free trade agreement. Nonetheless, a trade is going to be there whether or not the negotiations take place. Of course, a political decisions actually slow down rather than hasten 
matters like this. So these negotiations may be postponed. Who knows? The importance of Central America and our southern border. Thank you very much for that question, by the way. Mexico faces an enormous challenge that is not to prevent on the northern border what we can't prevent on the southern border. There has to be consistency in our policy. That's extraordinarily important for the country. What we cannot do, well, we can, but there's no moral authority to demand dignified treatment on the northern border if we are not making sure that we are doing that on the southern border. We have to be consistent. This has had an impact, for example, on the matter of Haitians in Baja California. What Mexico must do is ensure that border and immigration issues don't only fall on the shoulders of the border states. This is a national issue. What's happening in Baja California is not an issue just for Baja California. It's a matter that this Mexican state has to address. We have to look at legal strategies that ensure rule of law. We have to ensure that there's more humanity as far as migration issues at the borders and between. Mexico will have to respond as far as policies, especially as far as repatriation. You cannot repatriate people to a place where they don't belong. You cannot send back a child from Nicaragua and cannot do so through Tijuana. That is not something that can be done. We have to take a humanitarian approach to this. Today about how the importance of what Mexico does on its southern border uh, really is also critically important for its northern border and, and well, our. Well, sure, and, I, and we, you know we, we've, uh, as part of the, the I think the Merida initiative, we worked with Mexico to help to. In, increase some of the capability in the southern border. It helps both countries, whether you're talking about human smuggling or, or drug smuggling or other contraband. Uh, again, it's an example of where working together really benefits both countries. And then on the last point, I, I was baffled by the suggestion that you could require um, like Nicaraguans to, to be sent back to Mexico. I couldn't figure out how they could think that's possibly legal. My, my recollection was uh, we had an expedited removal for Mexicans to go back to Mexico, but generally for people from other countries, they have to be taken back in their receiving country. And uh, you know that becomes a bilateral relationship issue with the receiving country. Well, I, I've gone a bit over my overstatement. No. Correct, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Thank you all for coming. It, this is a, clearly an issue of great importance. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please stay in your seats as our panelists exit the room. If you have a translation device, please leave it at your chair as you exit. Thank you.